From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Morning Line with Nick Barris. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Morning Line. Nick Barris alive with you on this Monday. I hope you had a good weekend as we start this week off. Got a good show on tap for you. Uh, as you know, we just concluded gavel to gavel trial coverage of the Waffle House uh, murder case. Of course, Travis Reinking was uh, convicted on all counts and will be serving the rest of his life in prison, though he does have one more sentencing hearing coming on. One big part of that trial was the question of his sanity and competency. Then, I reported last week on the case of Michael Cummins, who currently is accused of mass murder in the slaughter of eight people in Sumner County in 2019. He was scheduled to go to trial in about a month and a half from now. But as I uh, reported first last week, that trial now is permanently on hold because he has been deemed unfit to stand trial. So a lot of the questions the general public has when they look at these two cases is one, all right, how is someone deemed competent or incompetent to stand trial? And what is the difference between that and, say, an insanity plea, which is more or less what Travis Ryan King went with after he was deemed competent to stand trial? But what is the difference even between the two of those? And who is it that makes the call? This is not the prosecution. This is not the defense. This is not the judge. These decisions are made by those who do clinical evaluations, experts on mental health. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because I think a lot of people are wondering with just these two local high profile cases. And so we've got just a terrific guest with us this morning from over at Vanderbilt. And uh, she's joining us by Zoom, Dr. Kimberly Brown. Good morning to her. She is a uh, forensic psychologist over at Vanderbilt. And I guess you were telling me before the show, you and your team have been involved in more than, what, 3,000 criminal, evalu criminal evaluations over the years? That's right, and good morning, and thank you for having me on the show, Nick. I'm glad to be here. So my team directs the forensic evaluation team here at Vanderbilt, and we have a contract to provide the court-ordered evaluations for Davidson County. And uh, during my 20 years at Vanderbilt, I've had the opportunity to conduct about 3,000 of those ev evaluations, although our history dates even before I, I took this job at Vanderbilt. Do you do evaluations outside of Davidson County with surrounding counties sometimes as well as it primarily Davidson? We primarily see individuals who are charged in Davidson County, uh, both adults and juveniles. And again, those are all court-ordered evaluations and, and primarily for two issues. One is for competency to stand trial and the other is about their state of mind at the time of the crime or the insanity defense. Uh, we do sometimes get involved in cases outside of this jurisdiction in other parts of Tennessee as well as in, in other states. But most of our work is in Davidson County for criminal cases. Well, you are exactly the person I want to talk to. Thanks for coming on because this is going to get some <laughs> uh, questions answered for us today. Um, I know just so we can say up front for our viewers and if we get calls, if there are any cases you're currently acting on or some in the past, certain ones that uh, are sensitive that you can't talk about, we'll try to talk in as general terms as possible. But based on what what you just said and I mentioned two cases um, I know you can't really comment one way or the other on the Michael Cummins case but uh, Travis Ryan King if what you just told me I would assume that case has been adjudicated but I mean I, I does, were you involved in that uh, my team was involved in that uh, we 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 were the court cool ordered evaluators who provided the initial outpatient evaluation in that case and one of our evaluators Dr. Wood did testify at that trial that's right, and I recall that. And do you work in conjunction, or is it one and the same with Middle Tennessee Mental Health sometimes where they send them, which is over there on Stewart's Ferry yeah, and so, Donaldson? Right, so we are different, different systems, um, so we, but we often work together on the same case. So just to kind of break it down, here's some reasons why we might refer someone to the state hospital, the state forensic hospital, Middle Tennessee Mental Health Institute. All of these evaluations start with an outpatient evaluation, which typically means that the person who's being charged with a crime is in the jail, and one of the evaluators from my team goes out to the jail and conducts an evaluation of the defendant. At that point, if that person is not competent to stand trial, which, which we can define and talk about in a minute, 
it's often the recommendation that they need to go to MTMHI, the state hospital, to become competent. Ah. So most of the time, the reason that we're interfacing with MTMHI is because we've seen them first, we don't think that they're competent in the jail setting, and we make a referral, and then the court orders them for a further evaluation in that inpatient setting. Gotcha. All right, let's 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 start then right at the beginning for some basics for folks. Before we get to insanity, let's talk about the determination of whether someone is competent or incompetent to stand trial, and then we'll explain the difference with insanity. So when someone, say Travis Ryan King, um, and we know, as I mentioned, and again, we won't ask you to comment on the, the Cummins case, but right now, he is deemed incompetent to stand trial. His trial is on hold for now until that changes. So talk about competency and how you determine whether someone is or is not competent to stand trial. Sure. Yeah, so good point. Competency and insanity are completely different terms. They are completely different terms under the law. They're also completely different terms under the forensic mental health system. So they pertain to different points in time. Competency to stand trial is about the person's current mental state, their current abilities to understand what's happening in their case and assist in their offense to go through the court proceedings. Um, the similarity between competency and insanity is that they're both rooted in a mental illness. But the time period for an insanity defense is solely the time, the, the frame of mind the person was in at the time of the crime. So competency is present day mental state. Insanity is a point in time in the past. So when we're looking at someone's competency to stand trial, we're looking at whether they have symptoms of mental illness that are interfering with their ability to understand what's happening to them, what they're charged with, how they can defend themselves and work with an attorney to uh, resolve their case. So it's important to note that many people who are in the criminal justice system who have a mental illness, which they're overrepresented in the criminal justice system, have some symptoms. Um, the key thing is, are those symptoms directly impacting their understanding of their legal situation such that they may be incompetent to stand trial? Now, if they are incompetent, typically what happens is uh, they need a period of treatment, often in an inpatient setting, as we just talked about, to become competent. So most people who are incompetent to stand trial, it's just a temporary state. In other words, uh, they are not medicated, they're not appropriately treated, and if they are, then they can regain those abilities and become competent to go forward in their case. If you would then, yeah, can you give me an idea just using just a, a general example of how you evaluate to determine, I mean, are there a series of questions? Are you asking them, you know, what's your name? Do you understand the crime against you? What, what kind of things do you evaluate to determine that? Sure. So in a competency evaluation, this is what most people um, probably wouldn't expect, is that, of course, we do a face-to-face -face evaluation of the defendant in which we go through information in a, in a structured way to, to ask certain questions and elicit information. And I can give you some examples. But, but the other thing about these types of, of evaluations that is, I think, somewhat more unknown is that we rely really heavily on information that's collected from other parties. So for example, past treatment records, information um, from the defense attorney about how they're interacting with that person, information from the jail about how the inmate is doing then. So we're not just relying on our one snapshot view of the person when we're directly evaluating and interviewing them. So it, it's, it's sort of like, um, you know, we have a bunch of puzzle pieces that we then put together to try to figure out what the big picture is. And we take puzzle pieces from all different sources. And ultimately, what we're asking the person, and it really depends on the individual person, on their symptoms and on their, on their situation and case, but what they're ask, we're asking them is detailed questions about their understanding of their charges, what they think could happen, what's likely to happen, what are possible pros and cons of different decisions they can make in their case, um, and how they think that they can defend themselves against the charges. So we're, we're competency to stand trial is often known as the understand and assist test. So we're, we're trying to find out if they have both a factual and a rational understanding of their legal situation, as well as the ability to assist counsel in their defense. So we're looking at both of those areas. And I think a real key thing is it's not just whether someone has a factual understanding. In other words, can just spit out what they're charged with and 
what the judge and the defense attorney and prosecutor do, but they actually have to have a rational understanding as well so that they can apply that information to their case and make decisions. Excellent. Listen, we have to take a break. When we come back, we have some calls, but also I want to follow up right after what you've said there about how you are able to determine whether or not someone is faking it or not. And then we're going to get into much more with our guest, Dr. Kimberly Brown, just fascinating stuff. We'll be back with more right after this.